Good morning. You know, I, uh, I have come to a place where I'm starting to think that all ministry should be family ministry. And uh, it's sort of an evolution that I've been going through over the last few years. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a parent who loves Sunday school. I have five daughters, and I teach in the Sunday school. And I really got started teaching in the Sunday school because we were in a small parish that didn't have a Sunday school. And so like a lot of Sunday school teachers, I think that's how we get started. We look around and say, I want my kids to have this, so I'd better do it. And uh, so I got to work in the Sunday school, and then as the kids got older, got more involved in the youth ministries. Oh, I sort of walked into our existing system in the Orthodox Church. We divide the kids up by age, essentially, right? The Sunday school is set up like a traditional school, so the kids are divided into grade levels. And then we have a separate ministry for the younger elementary kids, and then another for older elementary. We have our Goya for our teenagers. And, uh, you know, I came into it. That's how we do it. It made perfect sense to me. But as I started paying attention and kind of... Uh, you know, listening to different speakers and reading different books on the subject, I started to consider the fact that we had really imported this system, right? We brought this in from Protestant churches who worked out a plan to divide up the kids by age. And uh, I started realizing that in the Protestant world, they were starting to see flaws with this model. They were starting to see particularly that kids would kind of graduate from the youth program, right? They would finish high school and they would come out. And a lot of times they would feel like they had finished something and now they could maybe move on somewhere else. And so in the Protestant world, they'll see a lot of people switching denominations, which is something that didn't happen so much before. You were like, I think that in the Orthodox world, we really think of ourselves as being Orthodox, that we have an Orthodox identity. And they're finding that people have maybe stopped thinking of themselves as like, well, I'm a Methodist. I stay in the Methodist church, that the kids will come up and sort of finish the youth program and then be free to go to some other kind of a church or do something different or perhaps not go to church anymore, do something different entirely. So I started reading some of these articles and looking at studies about what they were seeing, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we're, maybe we should be cautious about what programs we're adopting, what kind of models we take into the church. And of course, in that, in that world, they are working to reintegrate they're working to um, stop splitting the kids out for worship, for example. You know, in Texas, the land of mega churches, you show up, at, there's a church near our house, you come, they have one of those little trams. It's like, you know, like a zebra cart that you might see at the zoo in the parking lot to help usher people to the entrance. You go and you hop on the cart and it stops at the different age groups. And so they have a separate worship environment, a different service, a whole different thing for different age groups. And uh, unsurprisingly, they're finding that that's really problematic. And so thank God, in the Orthodox Church, we've always had combined worship, and we never walked away from it. So we have this wonderful liturgical model. We come together in holy communion. We, we come together in the one cup. And it's not about separating us out into our groups but it's truly about bringing us together in the one liturgy. And so I think in many ways this may be part of why our kids grow up sort of feeling orthodox and maybe not feeling so much like they've graduated. And so at any rate, as I started thinking about the way that youth ministry works, it struck me that we should pay attention to this, that we should be aware of this idea that we don't really want our kids to identify as Goyans or as being a part of SOYO or whatever, whatever cute acronym we've worked up for our program, that we always want to make sure that they understand that they're full members of the church. And we want to make sure that we always have events and we always have activities that are always bringing everyone together and not only separating out. You can separate out some, but we have to be careful that we're not doing it too much. And so my focus has been primarily religious education, both at home and in the parish. But at one point, a friend of mine approached me and said, well, what would you think about writing this book? And it turned out to be Blueprints for the Little Church. And it was actually, it was funny because he, he is a convert. 
And he was saying, well, you know, I think when you come into the church, especially as adult married converts with children, it's so hard because converts get very enthusiastic, right? And orthodoxy has so much to offer. There are so many beautiful things we do in the church. But when you walk in new and you're very enthusiastic, you can kind of lose your mind and you can, you can, Caleb in particular, I always think of the example when he first converted, he had a wife and young children, and right away the first thing that he wanted to institute was reader vespers in the living room every night. And it wasn't going to work, right? His wife and his children weren't going to be able to do that. And so he had approached and said, well, maybe, maybe converts need a guide that helps them come into the church. And I came into the church, I'm a convert myself for for about 19 years now. I came into the church through the Serbian church, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, I know some people who were raised in the church who could maybe use some help, you know, figuring out how that looks, as we would say here at this conference, in a changing world, right? What does an orthodox lifestyle in a family look like today with all of the athletics and all the activities that our kids do and the different attitudes that our kids have and all the different challenges? So I was, honestly, I was afraid to write that book. I was afraid to be a part of it in some ways because, you know, you're just asking for trouble when you stand up and tell people how we can all do it. But so we found a way to write the book, I think, in a way where we brought in enough voices of different people talking about what's working and not working in their homes that surprisingly no one has gotten mad at me about this book yet. And I, I just, I was terrified of it, but it has worked out well. But as we were writing it, uh, in the introduction, we were very focused on the idea of the little church, in part because it's in our title, of course, but we really wanted to explain this wonderful idea St. John Chrysostom would talk about the little church, or the, the small church, that, that the household is the smallest unit of the church. Now, yesterday, uh, His Eminence Metropolitan Savas was speaking about Jesus' difficult sayings on the family, and it really struck me, you know, the little church he was talking about, I would say, your eminence, that this idea that Christ sort of tears up the family, that he divides the family, he came to separate the family, but then it's rebuilt in this beautiful way within the church, that it's put back together in a, in a fullness and in a wholesome way within the structure of the church. And we see this in the little church, where it's not a family unit that is separate from the church or that is independent and that might come into church on Sunday and then go back. But in fact, the family, the household, is meant to be the smallest unit. It's like a very small church, and it has a priest and his presbytera kind of in charge, mom and dad, or whatever adults are in charge of the household, act in that sort of pastoral way, taking care of the family. And then we have all of the members of this sort of tiny parish that then is a member of a larger parish, that's a member of, you know, perhaps a diocese or a metropolis. And and at the top of this, we have the patriarch. And so we have this large family structure, and inside it are these tiny family structures. And so as we were writing about this and thinking about it, I started to realize that there are ways in which the religious education that we're doing and the youth ministry that we're doing don't always support this very important structure. And just the experience of writing about how important that structure was really caused me to start looking at everything that I was doing and everything that I was involved in and different little conversations we would have. You know, we go to camp, and uh, I, I love to work at summer camps, so I spend as much time at summer camps as I can. It's hard to get away with when you're an adult, but, you know, I can do it for a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll talk about reentry stress and this idea that when a kid comes out of camp, they've had this beautiful experience, and then they go home, and it can be difficult to adjust back to home. And it made me think, well, what does that mean? Like, what are we, what are we doing to, if, if the most important structure is this beautiful little church, what are we doing if our youth ministry can be sometimes at odds with the little church? What does that mean? And so... That's, that's sort of been the direction that I've been thinking about lately, or religious education. Uh, you know, I think my generation of parents has a real weakness. We have a temptation to constantly outsource things. 
And I think that's in part because we want to give our kids the best. And so, you know, I'm okay at teaching you how to play basketball, but there's a guy over there who's really talented at it. So we're going to hire him to coach you to make sure that you're going to be great at basketball, right? And it just sort of goes on and on. We have a lot of private coaches. We have tutors for everything, right? Like parents. And some of that is because we're not confident. You know, education has changed a lot, for instance. Sometimes it's hard for a parent even to teach their second grader math because they're not sure how the school's teaching math now. So we just take them to a tutor and the tutor handles it. But so our generation has gotten really good at outsourcing parenting. And if you watch every once in a while, you'll see articles about weird things like there are people you could pay to teach your kid how to ride a bike. And there's someone you can pay to help you potty train. And there, you know, there are people, there are whole industries around just helping parents, or I would say not helping parents, parent, but really replacing parents as the parent, that we will hire someone else in. And so when you think about things like Sunday school, there's always a danger that, especially in a generation that is thinking this way, in a generation that always wants to see their child have the best teacher instead of themselves, um, that they start to think, well, religious education, I bring them to Sunday school. The church handles that. And so we come in on Sunday, and the kids go to class, and they learn something, and they come back, and the parents figure they've done a great job this week, and they don't have to worry about religious education anymore. That is checked off, and then we move on to the next the next subject. So that's a real temptation for parents today. And so I've been looking at that sort of in religious education and in youth ministry and just thinking about like what are the ways that we can support the little church and that structure. So I think that you know we all really know that and we see it very much in the Sunday school and in youth ministries that the kids who come from very engaged active families, the parents who are in church all the time, the parents who are talking to their kids about the faith, they don't even really need Sunday school. And they don't really need youth ministry necessarily. It's kind of icing on the cake, right? It's something that is fulfilling and fun and enjoyable to them. But without it, they would really still turn out very well because their families are doing such a great job. And so I realized that if we want all of our kids to grow up with a really robust faith, then we all need to become family ministry workers, right? We all need to be ministering to that family and serving that family, whether we're Sunday school teachers, whether we're youth ministry workers, or really with any job in the parish, we should always be thinking about how we're supporting those traditional and natural structures. Um, the, the main reason I would say that, well, as sort of a side note to point out, as much as a parent might want to hand off the religious education to a Sunday school, obviously this is not something Sunday school can really do in a profound way, right? Sunday school can explain to you the meaning of baptism or talk to you about a Bible story, but orthodoxy is not really a collection of, of lists of sacraments, and it's not just a collection of Bible stories that are well taught, right? Orthodoxy is truly a way of life. So you have to live orthodoxy every moment to really truly be an orthodox person. And so that has to be done in the home. And so teaching a child to be orthodox really could never happen anywhere except where they live. It has to happen in the household because that's where we pray, that's where we eat, that's where we interact with other human beings. And so I would say that that's probably why camp is our most successful youth ministry because camp, we live together. For a week, we come together, and we live, and we really live the faith. We pray together. We talk about the faith. We practice it in different ways in community. So it truly has to be a lived community to be passing on the faith. And so for at least one week, they get to come in and have this beautiful community. But what we really want to be doing, I think, is get, finding a way to help them have that community at home to help the household be that religious community that supports them and instills the faith in them. So that's where I've come, and I'm thinking about that in terms of like Sunday school and wondering, you know, could we do parish-wide curriculums? We're, we're trying sort of a, a pilot program at our parish. 
Uh, Father Evan Armitas has a program going at his parish that he's writing, and we talked him into letting us try it as well. We're helping out a little bit in exchange. Um, and in the next few years, God willing, it'll be available as a curriculum. But you don't really need that particular curriculum to do it. The idea is essentially that you could teach the same lesson to the whole parish on the same day. That there could be, Father could teach in the church to the adults. The kids can, when they head off to Sunday school, perhaps after liturgy, Father could talk for a few minutes about the lesson with the adults. The kids go off to class. And in every classroom, at a different age-appropriate level, developmentally on target, you would teach the same lesson in each class. And the idea behind this is that when the kids come out of class, that they will be able to talk amongst themselves. They'll talk to their parents. And everyone will have learned the same thing. And what's great about it is they'll all learn it a little bit differently. So everyone has something different to contribute to the conversation. But then there is a conversation. Uh, and, And that's sort of what I mean by finding ways for these other ministries to support the family. Finding a way that you're still doing Sunday school, but why not do it in a way that builds up the family instead of a way that doesn't. And that can be something as easy as having better communication with parents, right? If Sunday school teachers just emailed the parents every week and said, this is what we did in class, the parents would now have the ability to reinforce it at home and talk with the kids about it and bring it into their home. So I write about religious education and youth ministry, and I I travel around and I talk with parents. And I find that, you know, people are very worried. Parents are worried about how to keep their kids in church. They're worried about huge changes in the culture. Um, We've been talking at this conference very much about what a changing world this is. And that worries people, of course. I know that it worries us as well. I think we all feel a little insecure because things are shifting so quickly. The digital revolution, I think, is like the industrial revolution. I think it it will have tremendous consequences, and we don't even really know what they are, right? As as you, you know, read different books and look at the different studies, people are talking about the ways in which our brains are going to be developing differently. We'll be thinking literally in different ways because of these new inventions that surround us. And there are a lot of things that we can't predict that will be changing in in our culture. And so we feel that, and that insecurity, we can feel that there's sort of a crisis brewing. Uh, I think also in our culture, things are so contentious right now. There's so much arguing that you can really feel, (laughs) you could, I mean, even more so than just because the times are changing, but also I think because people are so tense and there is so much anxiety. We can feel that there is a kind of crisis bubbling up. And so I think parents have a lot of fear because they don't know what the world's going to look like for their kids and they don't know how their kids are going to handle this sort of post-Christian culture that's coming up around them. And I think among all of these shifts and changes, we see a lot of traps. We see a lot of traps for our kids, you know, with social media and technology, pornography, the drastically shifting moral structures, things changing so quickly. Um, we're, We're tempted in some ways, I think, as parents to just kind of shut it all down, you know, freak out, just like, just shut it down, don't let anything in, close it off. But of course, you know, we find that that's very, it's very hard to do, and most of us cannot really do that successfully. And and we want our kids to be able to engage with this world, right? We want our children to be confident Orthodox Christians who go out into the world and, God willing, have a positive impact on that world. And we can't really do that if we're, if we're closed down and hidden away. So we have these questions that we we have to work out. We have to figure out how we're going to engage with this world without losing things, without losing what's valuable to us. But I think one of the really important things that we have to remember is that all of these structures in the world, you know, even employment and homes and all of these things, they're all transitory, right? Like, you know, we we feel like we're going to make our kids safe by making sure that they get a good education and a good job and then everything's going to be fine. But the truth is, we don't really know whether their life... You can't make a person safe with education. You can't make a person safe with a good job or money, right? The things that, that matter in life, we can't guarantee. We don't know whether your spouse is going to get very ill. We don't know whether you'll be very ill or whether you'll pass away early. Or we, we can't protect them from all kinds of things that could happen in the world. And so instead, we set up these structures to make ourselves feel really safe 
uh, but they're not meaningful. So maybe, in a sense, we could remind ourselves not to be too afraid of the changing world because the things that are changing are, are not really what matters. The only thing that is truly enduring is Christ, right? God endures, and God will be here. Christ will be here 40 years from now, no matter what this place looks like and how it is. Um, so I, I thought today, you know, since we're talking about all of these changes, and I know later in the day we'll be talking about crisis, different kinds of crises that might happen in a family, and sort of working on ways that we can help families through those, I thought, well, maybe it makes sense to tell you a little bit about how I came into orthodoxy and how crisis figured into my evolution as an orthodox Christian and, and maybe, maybe a positive way that we can be thinking about crisis. Um, when I when, so I married into the faith, as I mentioned, my husband was Serbian Orthodox, and uh, I married in, and I was reluctant to convert because I did have a, a powerful faith. I was already Christian, but I had never been a member of a church community in any way. My parents didn't go to church, but I read the Bible and I understood. I prayed, and I, I loved God very much. I loved Christ, but so I felt like I came in, kind of knowing. Christ, and I was a little suspicious of orthodoxy. <laughs> I wasn't sure. You know, I wasn't sure what was going on with orthodoxy, and it was funny because, of course, I was in a church where nothing was in English, so there was that sort of level of confusion. But it was also that I would say to my husband, "Well, you know, what do you believe about this, and what do you believe about that?" And he didn't really know. <laughs> he wasn't sure, and so he, because he wasn't really able to articulate what orthodoxy was. And because so many of the priests that I would talk to did not have, they didn't speak a lot of English, or they would give me a book, and I would think that, well, I was, I was a little bit, I was sort of prideful. I was, I was very prideful. And I came in, as I said, feeling like I already knew. And I also knew what I wanted. And so I would go to a priest, and I would say, I want a book that explains the theology. And I wanted like a catechism book, right? And there was a wonderful priest who gave me a book called Father Arseni, which is a biography, right, of a very saintly and wonderful man. And I know now, years later, now understanding orthodoxy better and having read the book, that that was the perfect book to give me because I was coming in intellectually trying to dissect things, and this would get straight to the heart and communicate to me the real meaning of the church but I didn't read it, so it didn't do any of that. I looked at it and went, shh, this guy has no idea. He has no idea what I mean. And I cast it aside and uh, you know, continued on my very headstrong search for what I knew I needed. And uh, it just happened again and again. You know, I would be looking for what I thought I wanted to hear, and then when people would tell me other things, I couldn't stop and listen to what they were saying and, and read the books that they were handing me. So I just kept forcing my way through in this way. And as you can imagine, it was not going particularly well. But uh, I did convert, uh, but in a funny way, where it was sort of like I listened to the liturgy, I spoke to people, and I declared that orthodoxy was acceptable to me. You know, I, like, I didn't come in like I should have, now that I understand what the church is, recognizing how lucky I would be to be accepted to be in such a place that God would allow me to find orthodoxy in this country where it is so hard to find orthodoxy. Um, and this was back before we had, you know, internet articles on orthodoxy, and you couldn't really just go find something and search it. So I came in very pridefully and, and declared that orthodoxy was okay. It would fit. It didn't contradict anything that I already knew to be true. And so I came in. And what I really meant by um, coming into the church was that we would bring our kids to church on Sunday. That it was a geographical decision on my part, that that's where we would be on Sunday mornings. And so on Sunday mornings, we showed up at church. And we were there every week, and you know, or most weeks. And uh, over the years, we had a few kids, and life went on, and it was very nice. And on Sundays, we were in church. But I wouldn't really say that I had become orthodox yet, because I really didn't understand anything outside of, you know, this is where I'm going on Sunday. So after a few years, we had our third daughter. We had just moved to Texas, 
And uh, we didn't know anyone in Texas. And within a few weeks, my daughter was born, you know, in the middle of the night in an ice storm outside of Dallas. She was born at home accidentally. Like, not a home birth where you have a midwife or something, but more like it's the middle of the night and you were fast asleep and didn't know you were in labor and you just kind of wake up and give birth to this baby. And it was, you know, it was traumatic and out of nowhere. And she had a cleft lip and palate. And we didn't know she was going to have a cleft lip and palate. We were shocked. And, so, and I was there, you know, half crazy in the middle of the night, right? I mean, women know that hormones make us a little wild. And childbirth hormones really make you kind of... And so I was so confused to wake up in the middle of the night, give birth, find that she has this birth defect that I wasn't aware of. I was pretty sure I had caused the birth defect by not making it to the hospital on time. It took me hours to figure out that that was not the case. But, uh, you know, I just, I just sat in there, and uh, I just remember I just kept, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I just sat there and said the psalm over and over again and waited for the ambulance to come. And uh, the beautiful thing that happened was we had gone to a new church in Dallas when we moved, and we were in an OCA church. We had a young priest, and he had walked in. He had a Blackberry this was back when people didn't really have cell phones that often. And it was so remarkable to see an Orthodox priest with a cell phone because we had come from churches where still people were suspicious, right? Like, you know, the priests were like, maybe nobody should have a cell phone. We're not sure. The, this priest had a cell phone. And when we had met him, when we first came, he goes, oh, here, put your, my number into your phone and I'll put your number into my phone. And so we could call him on speed dial. Like, I'd never called a priest before. Like I said, orthodoxy was where I went on Sunday. It wasn't something that I invited into my home. It wasn't something... I didn't reach out for the church in an emergency. And so suddenly, we're talking to the priest, and he's coming for surgeries, because he had said, well, tell me when the first surgery is, and I'll be there. Like, what are you going to do at the surgery? You know, you're not a doctor. What are, what, are, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, I'll just come and sit with you. I had no idea that this would be a ministry of the church to just come and sit with us in our, in our anxiety and in our pain. And so that was my first experience, really, of family ministry, right? And it was wonderful. It was very helpful. And so our daughter, you know, we were so worried about her. We were so concerned. And uh, as it turns out, she is such an outgoing person. And you could tell even as a baby, we would laugh about it because we would go to these doctor's offices. She was in the doctor's office all the time. So we were constantly in waiting rooms. And even as a tiny infant, you know, a month or two old, you'd be sitting in a waiting room and she would make eye contact with the first person and make them laugh and then go to the second person and make her laugh and go. And she would make eye contact with every person in a room and make sure that she had gotten a chance to kind of charm each of them. And we thought, well, you know, she might be okay. I think she's, she's pretty outgoing. And she really is. And today she's, uh, she loves theater. And so she's just constantly on stage and doing beautiful things. And she's just perfectly happy and fine. But in those first weeks, those first years, we were so concerned and we were so worried. We had no idea how well all of this would turn out. But uh, so when it was, when it, you know, another year or so had gone by, I wanted to have more kids. We were really concerned about whether, you know, would the next one have a cleft? Would that matter? What, what do you do? Is it okay to keep having children if you find that now you have sort of, you know, we had a 4% chance of having another child with a cleft lip and palate? We weren't really afraid of going through that process as parents, but what was really on my mind was the idea that maybe someone would blame, like as a child, they would be like, well, you knew this was going to be wrong with me, and you went ahead and had another child anyway, and you could have spared me this problem, I guess, by never having me. I don't know. I, I worked it out in my head, and I decided in the end that... Uh, we wanted to be sure that our daughter, when she was an adult, would decide that she could have children if she wanted to have children, that she should go ahead and do it. So we knew that if we stopped, that would be sending her the message that this was a good reason not to have children. So we said, nope, we're going to do it. And we were very concerned, got pregnant again, thank God, and we're going through the pregnancy, and had, the doctor kept doing ultrasounds. We kept having to do all these high-level ultrasounds to be able to see, and it didn't look like there was a cleft, and we were so concerned about a cleft. And our baby was born, and he was just perfectly fine. And he, just a wonderful, sweet, healthy boy. 
and uh, he did not have a cleft, so we were very, very relieved, right? But on his 45th day, we put him down for a nap, and he passed away due to sudden infant death syndrome, which is one of those things that has no warning signs, right? That's why they call it sudden. It's just out of nowhere. And there's not even, they think, like not even really something wrong with the child. It's just there's like a momentary glitch that happens in the brain, and it just shuts down. And so that was, you know, here we had worried all this time about a dumb cleft lip, (laughs) you know, thinking that, oh, we had really skated by and that that was the worst thing that could happen. And, of course, you know, in life, we we never know what the worst thing can happen. Uh, You know, and even now, I don't know. I'm sure there are worse things that can happen to me. And thank God we don't always know how bad things could be. But uh, our son passed away, and it was, as you can imagine, awful, right? I think we all sort of commonly accept the idea that that's the worst thing that human beings go through is when we lose our children. And I notice even in the prayers of the church, uh, we'll say in a litany, we'll say, you know, we pray for our brothers and sisters and our mothers and fathers who've gone before us. We don't put our children who went before us in the litanies because it's so unnatural. And it's just so, you know, we just don't even want to think about the fact that that's, that that is one group of people who have gone before us. Many people have buried children. Um, it's a very, very, obviously a dark thing. It's really a terrible experience to go through. But it was interesting because, like I said, I had my priest on speed dial for the first time in my life. And I had started learning that you can call a priest and they will come to you and they will minister to you personally. And so that was one of the first things we did. Um, but just In fact, I wasn't even at the ho- We were in an ambulance on the way to the hospital, and my husband was already calling the priest and asking him to meet us there. And so our priest came, and he sat with me, and in those first minutes of just sort of coming to the realization and the understanding of what had happened, he was already right there. And he, he knew me. He knew that I had not been well catechized, that I did not really understand orthodoxy. And so he was right there beside me to help frame the way that I was thinking about things, which was so helpful to me. He would talk about how this is a fallen world, and we are frail. And God did not do this on purpose. God did not send down death to my family to teach us a lesson or because, you know, we needed something or, you know, some of my family and friends outside of the church would say, you know, there are just these cliches that we say to people and they're not really helpful. You know, we'll say things like, well, God has a plan. And so it was probably part of his plan and probably some really good things came from this. Like probably there are some people who were saved because he died that doesn't make any sense, right? That just doesn't make any sense. And I think what it does is it invites us to be very angry with God. It invites us to say, oh, okay, God couldn't find a better way to save someone else, so he's just going to come strike down my child. Like, that's, that's not who our God is. That's not a loving God. That's a misunderstanding. And I think it's well-intentioned. I think people want to feel like, you know, God's in control, and so then we give him this agency in every single thing. But sometimes bad things happen. And so our priest was there to say these things to me, which was very helpful because I had been growing up kind of without even a community or a parish. I had all kinds of crazy ideas in my head about how God was and, uh, and how he did things. So I thank God for that. I thank God for my priest being there because... because it helped us to turn to the church instead of turning away from the church. And I think so often that's the danger. When we talk about a crisis, when we talk about people going through something that is so painful and so difficult, the real question that happens at that moment is will you blame God and turn away from him in anger? Or will you turn to God to look for the peace that you're going to need to be able to survive this? Right? And as a church... We really have a role in helping people to turn to God instead of turning away. It's not something that just happens. 
it's not something that is necessarily like just their personality. They're just going to be angry with God. A lot of it is about their understanding of things. And, and as I pointed out, right, if, if we're telling them, well, you know, God did this on purpose to you so that you would learn patience or so that you would learn some wonderful virtue, you know, that would make someone angry. I can see where people uh, turn away from that kind of a God, as they say, right, I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in either. The, that's the God that I think people get very angry with. And I think that as a church, we can come and we can show love. We can sit there beside someone, as our priest did. And he was so patient. He just sat there for hours with us that first day, but then for weeks and months and years afterwards. And I often say, you know, as a parent, you generally you learn what your kids do. So, for instance, if you have a kid who loves dinosaurs, you know all about dinosaurs, right? And if you have a kid who loves basketball, you know who all the NBA players are. You, have, you, know, you know all the big techniques that they're learning to master. You just become an expert on basketball. And so when our Helena came along with a cleft lip and palate, I became very well-versed in craniofacial medicine. Like, I know a lot about that now. Um, and when Luca passed away, we, suddenly... I needed to know everything there was to know about the kingdom of God. I had to know where he was, what it was like, you know, what would happen. And of course, this is one of those things we can't know an awful lot about, although I tried to at first. I would find these books that would try to really describe heaven, and my priest would smile and say, well, no one actually knows that. <laughs> so, but, uh, but it was good because my priest was so available to me and said, you know what, every week I want you to come in. We're going to have a standing appointment and just ask me all your questions. And so it started with what happens when we die. Where is my son? Where is he? And what's he going through and what's it like there? And, and how do I get there? And, and over time, I just started learning all the theology of the church. And as I would come in, it wouldn't necessarily be on that topic anymore. It would be like, well, wait a minute. How does this work, and how does that work? And I would say things like, well, when I was a kid, I learned that actually God's just trying to teach Satan. And he'd be like, oh, that's a very old heresy. Like, how did you get that? How did, I'm like, well, you know, this, this is uh, what happens when you grow up outside the church, and there are just a lot of ideas floating around, and you try to put things together yourself. You come up with a lot of wrong ideas. And so I used to say it was like a process of weeding where we were just sort of weeding out the bad ideas from my brain and planting better ideas. But it was very beautiful. And so that time in my life was really, I would say, when I converted to orthodoxy. That's when I really encountered orthodoxy, when I came to understand it. But more importantly, it was when I came to rely on it. Because the other thing about crisis is that when we're, when we're going through life and we're very secure in what's happening in our world... We don't necessarily look to something. We don't feel like we need God. We don't necessarily need more. But in those times when we are really shaken, we understand that we're not in control and that the things that we're trying to do uh, aren't working, right? That we, we finally realize that we really do need God to be in charge because we can't handle it on our own. And so in those days, um, of course, you know, it was, it was a very difficult time. And I would spend hours in my closet because I had a lot of little kids running around. And if I was really sad and I needed to cry, I had to hide from them so that I wouldn't upset them because you have these challenges, right? When, when a parent goes through a crisis, uh, and I think in family ministry we're, we would be aware of this, we need to be aware of it, they have this sort of double problem of having to lead their children through the crisis and also sort of stumbling through the crisis themselves. And in some ways, that can help because in the process of answering our kids' questions, maybe we explain things to ourselves a little bit and and we can heal ourselves a little with that. But uh, it's also a really big challenge. And so when we lost our son, we already had three daughters. So we had to lead them through the grief as well. And... I would go into the closet, as I said, when I was very sad, and I would close the door, and I would cry, and I would be so frustrated, and I would just kind of call out to God. I just, there was nothing else I could do. I used to say I felt like I was emptied out with a melon baller, like somebody had just cleaned out my whole heart, you know, and I I would sit there, and I would cry out, and God would always come. He would always come to me in my pain, and I learned how to trust that, and I learned to know that he would be there. 
and we started go to, going to weekday liturgies. And we got, I came to a place where I just knew that I needed that peace. And so whenever there was a service at the church, I would always be there. And it would always help me. It would refresh me and give me strength. And that is not necessarily something that I would have come to, I think, without going through a major crisis, without going through something so difficult. Because I was really self-confident and I was self-sufficient in many ways and didn't understand that there was something else that I needed. And so as much as we hope to avoid crises and tragedies and all of these things. We also have to recognize in them that there's an opportunity here because these are the times when all of those things that distract us, you know, all of our, our very important schedules and all of the very critical, like the bill paying and all the stuff that we do that fills up our daily lives and gets in the way of us being able to be still and contemplate God. In those times, when it's really bad, that stuff just fades away. And in those moments, you truly are face to face with, you come face to face with death, but you also come face to face in many ways with the emptiness of your life and with how none of these things matter. And you start to see that, for us anyway, we really started to see that we needed to come closer to God, that we needed to come closer to the church, because that was where we were finding peace. So uh, the word crisis is interesting because it actually comes from the verb to sift. And a crisis is a sifting time. It's a time where those things that are important stand out and those things that are not important fade away. And I, I used to joke, I remember it was, you know, maybe it was a few months after our son had passed away. At some point, my husband and I were talking and he was like, oh, you know, that property tax bill is coming up, and we need to transfer some money so that we can pay that. And I looked at him, and I went, oh, we must be doing better. Like, if we just had a conversation about bank transfers and how to pay a bill, like, thank God, we've come somewhere. Because there was, and we sort of laughed about it, but it was like there had been months and months and months where, you know, I don't I guess, like, I must have been automatically, you know, getting notices that the electricity was going to be turning off and writing a check and sending it out. But we would never have even had a conversation about that in those early days because it just didn't seem important enough. It wasn't important enough to fill your time with. And so there's a, there's a real opportunity for us when we're in those places where we can finally see clearly our own limitations and our own powerless, powerlessness. And we can see clearly that, that a lot of these things that have been distracting us for so long really don't matter. And, uh, it's, and it's not always, obviously, the death of a child that would cause this kind of reflection in a person's life and these kind of needs in a person's life. Um, there are a lot of larger events that can make a crisis. And then there can also be what I would call sort of like adjusting to a new normal. You know, for, for, for people who have chronic challenges, you'll have, something will happen where maybe an ongoing illness gets worse. And now you have to adjust to this new level. And it's not that you're just going to get through it and then the person's going to heal and it's going to get better, but sometimes that's just an ongoing new challenge. And so we have these periods of adjustment. Um, but whenever these periods come up, I think the temptation, you know, is to despair or to be angry. We always have to remember that it's our job, I think, in family ministry to help the person turn back to the church. And it's interesting, there's actually the Center for Family Care published a study. In 2010, they published this wonderful study of various different Orthodox Christians throughout the nation. And they were asking them questions like, you know, have you gone through a crisis? Have you gone through tremendous stress in the past year? Uh, what did you do? How did your parish help you? How did your parish handle it? Um, and how did it impact your practice of the faith, right? So that sort of trying to identify people, were they falling away? Were they coming back in? And what was making the difference? And the summary of the study is, increased life stressors predict lesser attention given to spiritual practices at home and church. However, controlling for these stressors, increased support from parishes, increases the likelihood that parishioners will pay more attention to spiritual and religious practices, underscoring the importance of receiving support from parishes when under stress. So when you look at it, 
initially, when people go through these times of great stress, they may fall away a little bit. They don't show up at church as much. They're going off and they're doing something else. But if the parish is offering them support, they're attracted to the parish because they need the support. They start coming and they return. And when they're coming back into the practice of the faith, I would say that's the experience where God starts providing them peace because they're showing up and the Holy Spirit is at work with them. And so it's really the family ministry is not so much going to be to provide the peace to the person, but it's going to be to show them that there's support and love this way, to be almost like a signpost, right? Come this way. This is where you're going to get support. This is where you are loved. And then as they come, God can begin to work through us and also um, you know, through the church services, through the sacraments, through all of it. Uh, but that we want to attract them back to the church because that's really the most important thing because if you can turn to the church in a time of crisis, it becomes a transformational time, right? It becomes, it's salvific. It's, these are the moments, if we're at our darkest moment, and I can tell you that the moments that I had in that closet, when God would come to me, and it's hard to explain it in any way but that, but to just say that I could feel the comfort and the peace of God, that changed me forever. And from that moment on, I had such a trust in God because I had been at the bottom and knew that God was there. And so these moments, if we can sort of help people turn to God to call for him, those moments can change their lives forever and turn them into someone who then goes out and passes it along and passes it along. Um, Some of the crises that they found that people in our parishes would be going through, I think, in the study, you know, there's obviously the death of a loved one or a major illness, uh, but, you know, abuse in the family, gambling, addictions, arrests, serious marital conflicts, separation and divorce, financial crises, and also very commonly periods of depression or hopelessness. You know, like we said before, some of these things resolve. Some of these are sort of temporary situations, and some of these are just a new thing to adjust to, and it's going to go on for the rest of your life. And as parishes, we have to figure out, it's one thing to give a short-term support, but how do you give that long-term support? And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is youth equipped to serve which is the YES program. And actually, it's very convenient because I didn't realize to what extent Katrina would be kind of taking you on a YES trip last night. But uh, I work with Katrina sometimes, and I'm on the advisory board of YES. And we talk a lot about the idea that we want to teach children like how to practically live a Christian life. And so YES doesn't really talk about the kind of things that we would talk about in Sunday school. YES isn't teaching them about sacraments and things like that. I would say YES is more like Applied Love 101, right? Like there's theoretical mathematics and there's applied mathematics. This is like, sometimes we talk about, you know, love one another, love your neighbor. And we're not necessarily saying to each other what that really looks like. We don't know what that really means when you walk out of church and you head out into the world. How do you love your neighbor when you're standing in line at Starbucks? We're not sure, or or we don't talk about it anyway. But in the YES program, rather than simply telling them to love someone, they're literally trying to teach the kids how to give love, how to be a conduit of God's love in the world. And so Katrina comes. And she does actually the exact same things that she started last night with you. We talk about the difference between fixing and helping and serving. So we get a group of teenagers in a circle. And we say, you know, what would it mean to fix someone's problem? And it sounds like a nice thing, right? Oh, you have a problem and I'll fix it and then you won't have a problem anymore. But the trickiness of the word fix is that the implication is that you have a problem and I have a solution. So I come to you in my abundance of solutions and knowledge, and then I'm going to fix you in your weakness. or in There's kind of a haves and haves not that gets set up immediately there with the word fix. And then also the next word that she talks about is help. And that's also kind of a have, have not scenario, right? Help implies that you're lower than me, and I'm going to lift you up closer to where I am. 
Whereas service, to serve someone, is really humble, right? To be the servant doesn't mean that I have more than you have. It doesn't mean that I already know the answers to all of the problems. It, it puts you up high, and I come below you and try to do what I can to serve you. So they start out just talking with the kids about that. And, you know, when I first came into Yes, I thought, oh, okay, well, this is sort of a ministry to go in and and help people who are less fortunate, generally the homeless community, not always. Um, And it sort of is, but it's almost disguised that way. It's almost like a disguise because we'll come in and we'll start talking with the kids and explaining to them that they really need to be serving others, that they, we want to be finding the icon of Christ. And the way that the conversation unfolds, the kids are all discovering it on their own. And we'll play some games, like the game you played last night with the outside experts, right? And the experts go out of the room, and they come back in, and they're going to try to find the problem. And, of course, the, the trick to that game is understanding that there is not actually a problem. So for those of you who weren't here last night, we divided into two groups. One group went out into the hall and was told, you're going to need to come in and ask some yes or no questions and try to determine what the problem is that these people have. It's like a deserted island or something, right? This island group. What is their problem so that you can fix it, so that you can help? And so when we're in here, the islanders know that they're only going to answer yes or no questions. Women will only speak to women. Men will only speak to men. And if you're smiling, we're going to say yes. And if you're frowning, we're going to say no. So in other words, the communication is not really working, right? Because the outside experts are thinking that they're asking questions and getting answers to the questions, whereas the people are actually just responding kind of to the feeling that they get from the expert. And you can see where, in fact, I mean, in some ways, if you went out onto the streets and were interviewing people to try to figure out what was going on with them, their responses would be heavily dependent on what they thought of you and what your demeanor was. So that makes sense. But the other big lesson about that game is that there's not always a problem to fix. There's not always something wrong. Even if someone's living on the street, there may not, they may not want to come in right now, or they may not like you and want to come in with you, you know, that that they're still independent human beings and that we need to develop a relationship with people and not simply walk in, diagnose a problem, try to fix it and walk out, because that's not necessarily a loving response to other human beings. So we go through things like that. We play games like that. But there's something else that's really important that Yes does. And Katrina and I have talked about this because I think... Over the years, it's become more and more important. One of the details of the yes trip is you put your phone away. You don't bring a phone on a yes trip. We don't use our phones for the weekend. And that can be a really big deal for the kids. Like, that can be really hard for them. And it's kind of funny. I have a 16-year-old, and uh, at one point she got in trouble, and we took away her phone, right? Because this is what happens endlessly in American houses now. Every time somebody's doing something wrong, you want to lose your phone? I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it for a week, all week, no phone. The big threat. So we took her phone for a whole week. And uh, she was frustrated. She really wanted to see her friend. She was, she was bored, and she wanted to go see her friend, who lives across the street. And so we said, well, here's an idea. Why don't you pick up this landline, dial their phone number, and ask her if you guys could hang out? No. People don't do that, Mom. This is not 1984. Okay. All right. But you know what you could do? You could go over, you could knock on the door, right? Just go knock on the door and be like, hey, is Julia around? Nope, people don't do that, apparently. That is not done. So if you can't, like, Snapchat somebody to see if they're available to hang out, you can't hang out with them. So without Snapchat, she was totally immobilized and did not see her friend all week. And it was terrible. But... So, I mean, you know, teenagers are very reliant on their phones. There, there are ways that they do things, and those things are done through various different apps on their phones. So when they come into the Yes Trip, and we have them put their phone away, and now they're expected to really communicate with other people, and they have no phone to text that person sitting next to them, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to learn a whole new method of communication. And in some ways, I mean, it's kind of a funny thing, because I think with Yes, they first took away the phones just because it was a distraction. Uh, And now we're finding that increasingly kids really actually need a lesson in how to interact with other human beings. And it turns out that this is a really good way to do it. 
because one of the things that Katrina is teaching them is called active listening. So she will talk to them. She won't tell them that it's called active listening. But she'll say, as she's talking, the kids will start moving around, and they're looking away, and they're whispering amongst each other. And really gently, she'll be like, you know, when someone's talking, you really need to have eye contact. When someone's talking, you shouldn't be talking to someone else. You shouldn't be fiddling with things. And slowly, in the course of this long conversation that night, she's training them with how to really listen to another person. And she talks about things like, you know, a lot of times when we're listening to someone talk, we're thinking about our response. And we're nodding, and we're ready to jump in with, oh, that happened to me once, you know, or, oh, yeah, when I... And so she asks them not to do that all weekend. And in fact to avoid I statements all weekend. And we talk about, for example, the absurdity of standing on a street corner with someone who maybe lives on that street corner and commenting that you're cold, right? You say, oh, I'm cold. You know, guess what? You have four coats at home and you can hop in the car and go home. This person's gonna be on the street tonight when it's much colder than that. It's absurd and obnoxious to say I'm cold in that circumstance. But also, we talk to them about how it impacts just the whole group morale, right? Like, oh, I'm tired, right? One person starts saying, oh, I'm tired, and everyone starts thinking, oh, I'm tired too. So we tell them, no I statements. Don't talk about yourself all weekend. And it's hard for some, and some of them are unsuccessful, but they're trying. Uh, But many of them kind of fall right into it. And another funny thing about yes trips, she doesn't give them a schedule and they don't really know what's coming. And we'll just say things to them like, you know, we just want to live in the moment and we want to be available for whatever God sends. Now, you know, the adults have worked out a plan and they know where we're going, but we don't really know what's going to happen, right? Things could change or perhaps what ends up happening with every one of these trips is you end up having like a theme that presents itself. I remember one time we went out and the theme turned out to be freedom. We hadn't chosen the theme, but as we would walk around, different people on the street would start talking to us about their experience as a veteran and how they had fought for freedom and what freedom meant to them. And then you would go somewhere else and all of a sudden there would be a big quote on this restaurant's wall and it would have the word freedom. And you would just find that like there was this whole conversation about what really is freedom and are we free in Christ even. Like that it could become this beautiful conversation, but it was a conversation that just presented itself, that God allowed it to unfold in front of us. And so we sort of spend the weekend watching for what is God doing? What is God saying to us through these other people? And I know Katrina mentioned it uh, last night, but it is an interesting thing because in Texas we have a lot of church groups who go out on the street. I mean, it's kind of funny. Like in Austin, we're out on the street, and they'll be like, so you're a church group? Which one are you with? And you look, and there are like eight around town, like just wandering around the same streets, talking to the same people. Um, But a lot of the church groups come to tell you the good news about Jesus Christ to let you know. And my favorite is I have, and this is a really lovely group of people and they do a lot of good work, but it's funny because they will say to people, you just need to stop sinning so that your life will get, like just stop sinning. Like we just all have to stop sinning and then things are gonna be all right. And which is just such a crazy, (laughs) from an Orthodox perspective, the idea that a human being could ever just stop sinning and then everything would be fine is funny. But, uh, but we, say, we say crazy things to people sometimes out on the streets. And so we try to get the kids not to say crazy things and not to try to give their wisdom, right? We're here to serve. We're not here coming from, I have all of this abundant knowledge about Jesus Christ, and I am coming to give it to you any more than I'm coming to, to hand down anything to you. And what you find is that the people that we meet start teaching the kids They start talking to them, and they start telling them about Jesus Christ. And they start telling them, because they have found, like I found, that when we're at our darkest time, Christ comes to us very easily. Where there's suffering, he he is always there. And so these people have suffered, and so they know God very well, and they know Christ very well. And they're not looking for wisdom from a 14-year-old who's walking down the street, uh, but instead they're very interested in giving wisdom to 14-year-olds on the street. So it becomes a really beautiful experience, and the kids learn a lot. And, and it's just, it's wonderful. And 
What they're really learning, though, is how to be a human being. You know, that's what they're real. I mean, it's not really homelessness. It's not homeless service in some way. It's not, they're not like fixing problems for people on the street, which is what they think they're going to do when they come. And that's what the parents always, the parents are always like, well, what exactly, what service projects are you going to do? It's like, well, it almost doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter where we go or what we're doing. We're teaching them to interact with other human beings. And so it's not always people on the street. It's often that's part of it, but we'll also take them to the mall or they'll also go, you know, to, we, at one point on an Austin trip, uh, we went to a shelter, and then we went to the most expensive hotel in town. And we just talked about, like, well, look at the size of this room. Like, so this room's $300 a night. That room's $2 a night. You know, isn't it interesting? And then all of these people in this hotel, are they happy? Are they fulfilled? And you just sort of sit in the lobby and watch people walk back and forth and think about the idea that in some ways... They may be impoverished spiritually or socially. They may be having all kinds of struggles. And that we can serve them too. That it's not a question of just finding like this one community that we're going to serve, but that all of the human beings out there really need us to come and to listen and to talk and that they really appreciate it. And so when we do this with the kids, we teach them how to be human beings and we teach them what it actually looks like to just be loving in the world. And so it strikes me that family ministry could do something like this. So I, here's what I'm thinking about. When we, when, so we divide up the church, right? And we talked about that earlier, that we have all of these, we have different ministries and we have different groups of people. And, you know, we have this one group, this is for the young adults and that is for the kids and this is for the older people and this is for the middle. And we're dividing everything up all the time, which is not really a necessary or inherently orthodox activity in the first place. Um, And we tend to get a group of people and say, well, you're going to be like the team of people who does family ministry. You're going to go support people and you're going to take care of people. And that can be really hard. As we talked about yesterday, you know, healers need to take care of themselves or caregivers need to give themselves care. They need to be careful about burnout. It can be a lot. It's a lot on two or three people in a parish to be taking care of everyone who's going through all of the different kinds of tragic situations and difficult situations. But what if there were yes trips for adults, right? Which is funny because I was planning on asking that question and then last night I kind of witnessed the first half of a yes trip for adults. I was laughing. I was talking to Katrina. I'm like, wow, you went through kind of the whole Friday night activity. If only we could get up in the morning and go to a nursing home for a couple of hours, we would have really done a yes trip. But it's an interesting idea. We tell each other that the most important commandment, right, love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love your neighbor as yourself. We don't necessarily teach people in our parish how to love our neighbors. We kind of assume that that's something people know how to do or will figure out how to do. But our kids aren't figuring it out on their own necessarily, right? But we'll sit them down. We'll send teenagers to do that. We send teenagers to camp. We, it's funny how... In, you, you know, we assume that kids should be going, going through all these classes and doing all these things. And then as adults, you know, you throw a retreat at your parish and 20 people come. No matter how big the parish is, it feels like 20 is about how many people come to every retreat. But uh, it's funny because as adults, we don't think we need that, but we think that the kids do. But wouldn't it be interesting if we took even one simple idea like active listening and we found a way to just teach a whole parish how to do that? How do you just sit and listen? Sit still. Don't drum your fingers. Don't look around nervously like you're trying to get away from the person. Don't think about the next thing that you're going to say. Don't use any sentences that say I. When somebody tells you a story, don't say, oh, I, 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 that happened to me too. Just listen to it and nod and be like, wow, that is really, that sounds like it was really difficult. That sounds like it was really hard. If we were able in some way to reach out and to give, kind of deputize everyone to be a family ministry worker, right? What if everyone could do this for each other? What would be different in the parish? I think about, you know, the problem that when someone goes through a serious illness or a serious difficulty, they might walk away from church. They might feel like they don't belong. We talked about last night, if you have a fairly affluent parish 
uh, people who don't have much money show up and they see that everything costs money to do and there's always the luncheon and everything you're supposed to be writing a check for, they feel like they can't write checks, they might not come back. They don't feel like they belong in this parish. There are a lot of different ways that people can just find out or sort of intuit that they don't belong. Whereas if we had parishioners who were really conscious of the idea that just sitting with someone, just listening to them actively and really paying attention, if they were really in tune with the idea that that's what it means to be a Christian, we might be such a welcoming parish that nobody would ever want to leave, right? Or you think of, you know, I... You think of when someone gets married to someone who comes in from outside the faith, and they come in and they feel like it's a closed club. You know, the spouse doesn't feel welcomed, like the like the one who grew up in the church, and then they both end up leaving, right? But if we were the kind of a parish that was really sitting there and listening to you and taking in what you were saying, no matter who you were, we would get to know those people and we would love them, and it would be fine. They would all stay. I mean, it just it's one of those things, when you think about it, it's a very simple idea. But when we divide things up and when we say, well, we're in family ministry, this little group of us are going to minister to the families, it might be better if we decided instead to say that our whole church is family ministry and to try to deputize all of our parishioners. People will be better at it or worse at it. But uh, I just, as I'm thinking about all of these sort of things over time, I feel like in general, one of the things we need to be doing with our ministries is just not dividing them up so much, not walling things off so much, but connecting them all together and inviting everyone inside and just waiting to see what kind of beautiful things can happen. Um, you know, Bishop John spoke to us yesterday, said, and the quote was on the paper, which was so helpful because I know when you were speaking, we were all scrambling to write down what you were saying because it was so beautiful. And then when we got the handout right afterwards, it was on there. I was so relieved because I was like, I have to... I have to remember that. You said being right with God and each other creates a satisfaction and a sense of peace and is in itself healing. Sharing our peacefulness is godly hospitality. That's what we were all writing down. Godly hospitality. This is a tool and responsibility of all Christians. It is a responsibility of all Christians to offer that godly hospitality to one another So maybe we need to be teaching all of the people in our parish how to do that, how to provide a place of healing, because it's our job to be building up all Christians, right? Not just the children, not just turning the children into Christians, but truly turning every one of us into Christians. So just in conclusion, I would would remind us that the more that we're able to support individuals and families who are going through a crisis— the more the church really in a very personal way reaches out and shows up, the more likely they are to understand that this is where the locus of support and healing and love is, that we have to indicate that to them. And when they see that and they come, they will find healing, and they will find that the Holy Spirit is transformative in their lives and that this situation that they've been in somehow will bear good fruit because that's what God does. That's what God does. He's just, he just is the source of goodness. And so when God comes up against something that is a bad situation in your life, he just he can't help but transform it into something good. Good fruits always come from the Holy Spirit. And so, but it's our job to remind people that this is where you come for support and love. And we don't remind them by telling them or lecturing them. We don't remind them by saying, you know, well, you're in a bad way, and so you should be at church more, not less. No, you know, we need to be supportive and loving. And then they'll be attracted to that because that's what they need for healing at this time. And so uh, I think that really concludes my talk.